Jordan versus LeBron. LeBron versus Jordan. It's a debate that has captured the public's attention for the last several years, especially after this moment in 2016, when LeBron James beat the Golden State Warriors to win the third championship of his career. In LeBron's own words, That one so right there made me the greatest player of all time. For That's so what many I felt. reasons. I was like, that one right there made you the greatest player of all time. But did it? Is everything since that moment simply icing on LeBron's cake? Or is LeBron destined to finish his career in Michael Jordan's shadow? We've all heard the arguments from LeBron supporters. He's bigger, he's stronger, he's faster, he's more durable. And from Jordan supporters. Michael Jordan was merely 6-0 and oh with six MVPs in the finals. But the GOAT debate isn't as simple as the pundits make it seem. There are a number of factors relevant in determining the greatest basketball player of all time. In fact, I would say there are five things that really matter when determining the GOAT of any sport. These criteria are, in no particular order, accomplishments, longevity, winning, statistics, and what we'll refer to in this video as the eye test. And to be the GOAT, you don't need to be the best in any specific category, but you need to be pretty good across the board. So simply winning seven championships, like Robert Ory did, isn't enough to get you into the conversation. When we're finished with this video, it'll be plainly obvious that one guy comes out on top. But before we get started, I want to clarify that this is not a comparison of legacies. It's about who was the better basketball player. If we were talking about legacies, Jordan's is nearly untouchable. Not only did he lead basketball to global popularity, he helped transform Nike into an empire changed the way players played, and how they dressed, and he even made it cool for guys to be bald. And while those things certainly contribute to MJ's iconic status, they don't make him a better player on the court. So let's evaluate the criteria that matter, and we'll start with individual accomplishments. Take a look. Jordan had more regular season MVPs, twice as many finals MVPs, nine more scoring titles, and several more selections to the NBA's all-defensive team, including once being named Defensive Player of the Year. LeBron has more all-star appearances, but that's largely due to his having played more seasons. In fact, when taking into account retirements and major injuries, Jordan essentially played 13 seasons compared to 17 seasons for LeBron, making Jordan's significant lead in accomplishments all the more impressive. And that's to say nothing of MJ's brilliant college career, which saw him twice named All-American and once awarded College Player of the Year, at a time when the country's best players actually went to college. So regardless of whether you're a LeBron fan or MJ fan, you have to give the accomplishments checkmark to Jordan. The second criteria in our GOAT analysis is longevity. And this one is also a no-brainer, but this time in favor of LeBron. Not only has LeBron played more seasons in the league, but he's had a longer peak than Jordan. Jordan's peak lasted about 10 years, whereas LeBron's peak has lasted 16 years and is still going. And he's been incredibly durable during that time, missing significant time to injury only in 2019. That said, the claim that LeBron has been much more durable than Michael has been a bit overblown. Consider that Jordan played in at least 80 regular season games 11 times in his career, including all 82 games an incredible 9 times. Compare that to LeBron, who played in at least 80 regular season games just twice, and in all 82 games just once. So both LeBron and Jordan get high marks for their durability. But durability aside, the bottom line is that LeBron has sustained his level of excellence for a much longer period of time than Jordan, which puts the longevity check mark squarely in LeBron's corner. That brings us to the third GOAT criteria, winning. As we all know, Jordan won six championships, LeBron has won three. Jordan is 6-0 in the NBA Finals, LeBron is 3-6. Yes, LeBron has made the Finals nine times compared to only six times for Jordan, but let's not pretend that making the Finals is the same thing, or even close to the same thing, as winning a title. Take a prime example from another sport, the Buffalo Bills. They're the only team in NFL history to appear in four consecutive Super Bowls. But is there a single player or fan of that team that wouldn't trade all four of those appearances for just one Super Bowl win? Frankly, talk to any fan whose team lost the season's final game and ask them how they felt afterward. Almost universally, their feelings are of sadness, anger, and disappointment. And that's just the fans. For players, those feelings are only magnified. Listen to Charles Barkley talk about losing in the NBA Finals. 
And I was just in shock when it was over because uh, I had to. Uh, I was frustrated because I couldn't wheel my team past Michael and the Bulls. And it, first of all, I probably think I don't think I've ever gotten over it. Number one, but that was traumatic. And it's just, it's painful. So we can all stop with this false equivalence between winning the championship and finishing runner-up. In the words of Herm Edwards, You play to win the game. Hello? You play to win the game. Now back to Jordan and LeBron. As mentioned, on basketball's biggest stage, the NBA Finals, Jordan was 6-0. LeBron was 3-6, and six. and frankly, that doesn't even show how lopsided their records really are. In terms of individual finals games, Jordan was 24-11, and 11. LeBron is 18-31, and 31. and that's because in four of his six finals losses, LeBron's team hasn't even been competitive. Twice he got swept, and two other times he lost four games to one. That includes being on the wrong side of the two most lopsided finals by margin of loss in NBA history. Of course, LeBron fans will tell you that the only reason for LeBron's poor finals record is that his competition was so tough. Ironically, some of these same fans criticized Jordan for losing early in his career to a Celtics team stacked with five Hall of Famers, and they conveniently gloss over the fact that LeBron reached the finals so many times in part because the competition in his own conference was so weak. During the vast majority of his career, LeBron played in what many dubbed the Leastern Conference because the East was so much weaker than the West. On the other hand, during Jordan's playing days, the East was generally considered the stronger conference, as Jordan had to battle through hard-fought rivalries against the Bad Boy Pistons, Patrick Ewing's Knicks, the Shaq Penny-led Magic, and Reggie Miller's Pacers. That said, if you want to blame LeBron's failure in the finals on the level of his competition, I won't argue with you. But let's also not blow it out of proportion. If you look at the average number of wins of their finals opponents, You'll see that LeBron's finals opponents average 60.8 wins per season, whereas Jordan's finals opponents average 61.2 wins per season. So as it turns out, both players face stiff competition in the finals. But a big reason we don't hold the 93 Suns, the 96 Sonics, or the 98 Jazz in the same regard as some of LeBron's finals opponents is because, unlike LeBron's adversaries, Jordan's opponents never actually won the Larry O'Brien trophy. Which goes to my original point that the difference between winning the title and finishing runner-up is huge. And the reason those teams never won the title? This guy. Look, I'm not trying to say that Jordan's opponents were as good as the Warriors teams that LeBron faced four times in the finals. The truth is that Jordan never played a juggernaut quite like that. But there's a pretty good reason for that. Jordan's Bulls were the juggernaut. They were the team winning 70 plus games. They were the team with the target on their back every year. And as the Warriors showed us, that's not an easy place to be. As great as the Warriors were, they were never able to string together three consecutive championships. Jordan's Bulls did it twice. So what's the greater achievement? Beating the Juggernaut or being the Juggernaut? Or to be more specific, beating the Juggernaut one time out of the four times you faced them? Or being the Juggernaut year after year after year? and then doing it again, year after year after year. There's no doubt that LeBron's victory over the 73-win Warriors was the highlight of his career. But it's not the first time that an underdog has won the championship, and there actually have been much bigger underdogs who ended up winning the title. But how many times have we seen a player lead his team to six championships in eight years? Prior to Jordan's Bulls, only Bill Russell's Celtics ever accomplished that feat in the NBA, when they incredibly won 11 championships in 13 seasons. However, back then, there was an average of less than 10 teams in the league, and only a couple rounds of playoffs, so it was considerably easier to win a title. And no player, not even Bill Russell, ever had a run of winning 25 of 26 playoff series, as Michael Jordan did. And Michael's pattern of winning goes beyond the NBA. Let's not forget that Jordan has never won anything but gold in the Olympics, and he also earned an NCAA championship in which he hit the first of two iconic championship winning shots in his career. All that is to say, when it comes to winning, the checkmark clearly goes to Jordan. On to the fourth GOAT criteria, statistics. This one is a bit more complicated, 
I mean, how do you statistically evaluate two players who played in different eras under different rules at different positions? One way of doing it is to simply look at the eight traditional statistics of basketball. Points, assists, rebounds, steals, blocks, field goal percentage, free throw percentage, and turnovers. And we'll focus on per game stats rather than cumulative stats, since cumulative stats such as total career points and total career assists really speak to longevity, which is already its own category of the GOAT analysis. Per game stats, on the other hand, is more of an apples to apples comparison. So looking at the eight traditional stats, we see that Jordan leads LeBron in five of them, points per game, steals per game, blocks per game, free throw percentage, and fewer turnovers. LeBron leads in the other three, assists per game, rebounds per game, and field goal percentage. But that's a pretty simplistic way of looking at statistics. What if we instead turn to analytics? Probably the most well-known analytics stat is player efficiency rating, or PER for short. This metric was created by respected basketball analyst John Hollinger to give an overall rating to a player's performance based on traditional stats like the ones we just mentioned. Jordan has led the league in PER seven times, LeBron six times. Jordan has finished top three in PER ten times, LeBron nine times. In fact, Jordan has the highest career PER in both the regular season and the playoffs. Another popular analytic stat is win shares. Jordan has led the league in win shares eight times, LeBron five times. Jordan has finished top three in win shares 11 times, LeBron six times. And when it comes to win shares per 48 minutes, Jordan has the highest career rating in both the regular season and the playoffs. What about box plus minus? Until recently, LeBron was actually ahead of Jordan in career box plus minus. But after the 2017 season gave Russell Westbrook the greatest single season box plus minus in history by a wide margin, the architect of box plus minus realized that the stat was fundamentally flawed. So he made some changes to improve its formula. As a result, Michael Jordan now has the highest career box plus minus in both the regular season and the playoffs. And lastly, what about value over replacement player? which on its face seems to favor LeBron James. Well, value over replacement player is a cumulative stat. And as previously noted, cumulative stats speak more to longevity than they do game to game dominance. That said, according to value over replacement player, Jordan owns six of the nine greatest individual seasons ever played. And on a per game basis, MJ's career rating in value over replacement player is the highest of all time in both the regular season and the playoffs. Are you noticing a theme here? Not only does Jordan beat LeBron in every ratable analytic stat, he consistently ranks as the best ever across the board. Before we move on from analytics, I want to mention a lesser known stat called Game Score, another brainchild of John Hollinger. Game Score measures a player's performance in a single game, so it won't tell us who's had the better career, but it does provide insight into who's had the greatest games. Now, we only have game score stats since 1983, so you won't see any mentions of Wilt Chamberlain here. That said, of the 100 highest game scores ever recorded, incredibly 19 of them belong to Michael Jordan. In other words, nearly one out of every five of the best single game performances over the last four decades has been by MJ. That includes the highest game score of all time for Jordan's 69.18 rebound masterpiece Comparatively, LeBron has had only three of the top 100 game scores. When discussing the GOAT, Nick Wright is fond of asking this question. The aliens come down. You have one game to save humanity. Who's your first pick in the history of the world? Well, Nick, I think we have our answer. Now that I've finished drowning you in numbers, let's be real. Hardly anyone watching this video knows how to calculate PER, win shares, box plus minus, value over replacement player, or game score. And why should you? This is basketball, not goodwill hunting. So let's go back to the traditional stats that we all know and understand. But this time, let's add context to them. What do I mean by context? Well, some positions are simply better than others at racking up certain stats. Let's take rebounding as an example. In a vacuum, if we simply compare the number of rebounds per game of Brooke Lopez and Jason Kidd, we might think that Lopez was the better rebounder. The truth is, relative to their positions, Lopez is statistically one of the worst rebounding centers in NBA history, whereas Kidd is statistically one of the best rebounding guards in NBA history. 
but even a poor rebounding center can grab more rebounds than a great rebounding guard solely by virtue of their roles on the court. So it makes sense that, to understand the context of a player's stats, we should compare them to the respective positions that they played. When comparing LeBron James to the other small forwards who have played at least 500 NBA games, this is where he ranks. Overall, that's pretty impressive. Now let's see how Jordan compares to all shooting guards who have played at least 500 NBA games. As good as LeBron is compared to other small forwards, Jordan is on another level when compared to other shooting guards. He's darn near the top of every major statistical category, and there isn't a single category where LeBron is better than MJ relative to his position, other than assists. So to sum up statistics, whether comparing traditional stats or analytics, and especially when judging these players in the context of the positions they played, Jordan has a noticeable edge over LeBron. As such, we have to give the check mark to Jordan. And that takes us to the last category in our GOAT analysis, the eye test. And to be clear, by eye test, I don't mean which of these players is bigger, faster, or jumps higher. None of that is relevant unless we're having a track and field competition. And frankly, if physical measurables mattered, then George Murison would be in the GOAT conversation. No, what I mean by the eye test is, if you sat an average basketball fan in front of a TV to watch a player in action, what would he notice that the player is and is not great at? Thankfully, I happen to be an average basketball fan, and I've had the privilege of watching both LeBron and Jordan during their playing days. So unlike a lot of my fellow YouTubers, I haven't merely relied on highlight videos. Here's what my eyes told me when I saw Michael Jordan play, particularly during his playing days with the Chicago Bulls. He was the best offensive player in the game. He was arguably the best defensive player in the game. He had the best mid-range game. He was the best finisher at the rim. He had the best post-up game, which is incredible considering most players who dominated the post were big men. He was widely considered the most clutch player in the game. He was regarded by opponents as the fiercest competitor on the court. He was regarded by teammates as the hardest worker in practice. And when all was said and done, amongst the other stars of his generation, he was the greatest winner. Now when you're playing against the elite of the elite athletes of the world, to be the best at any one of those things is pretty remarkable. But to be the best at all of them? I tell you it's impossible, but for the fact that we saw Michael Jordan do it. And when it comes to the GOAT debate, that's the biggest hurdle facing LeBron. He's basically being compared to a guy who was great at everything and practically had no weaknesses. Seriously, judging by the eye test, what's the worst thing we could say about Michael Jordan's game? Probably that he wasn't a very good three-point shooter. Jordan shot 33% from beyond the arc in an era when the average player also shot 33%. So when it came to three-point shooting, he wasn't good, he wasn't bad, he was just average. But remember that Michael played in an age when the three-point shot wasn't a big part of the game. During Jordan's years, teams averaged only 9.5 three-point attempts per game, and Michael himself attempted less than two threes per game. And if being an average three-point shooter is a weakness of Michael's game, well, then we also have to call it a weakness of LeBron's game. The difference is that LeBron plays in an era where the three-point shot is a huge part of the game. During the years in which LeBron played, teams attempted on average over 21 threes per game, and LeBron himself averaged 4.3 three-point attempts per game, or two and a half times as many as Jordan. Despite the increased emphasis on threes, LeBron's career shooting percentage from beyond the arc is only a hair better than Jordan, at 34%. And it's actually slightly below his peers, who averaged 35% from three during his era. But to reiterate, being an average three-point shooter was by far the worst part of MJ's game. For LeBron, it's not even close. LeBron, in fact, has four major weaknesses as a basketball player each of which is readily apparent to anyone who has actually watched him play. First, he's not a good free throw shooter. For his career, LeBron has shot around 73.5% from the free throw line, which is pretty poor for a player who handles the ball as much as he does. In fact, many analysts point out that, at the end of games, LeBron shies away from driving to the basket because he's afraid of being sent to the line. I don't know whether that's true, but what I do know is that the odds of LeBron hitting two consecutive free throws is statistically not much better than a coin flip. Jordan, on the other hand, shot a solid 83.5% from the free throw line during his career. And MJ never shied away from contact at the end of games. LeBron's second weakness is that he's an inconsistent defender. 
Sure, he's had some years where he was elite defensively, which is evidenced by his numerous selections to the NBA's all-defensive team, but he's also had several years where he's practically been a liability on the defensive end. Compare that to MJ, who during his Bulls days was a consistently elite defender. In fact, Jordan is the only player to rank in the top 5 amongst all guards in both steals per game and blocks per game for his career. Additionally, Michael led his position in defensive win shares practically every year that he played for the Bulls, an incredible 10 times. LeBron, comparatively, has led his position in defensive win shares on just four occasions, and in five of his last seven seasons, he didn't even crack the top 10 at his position in defensive win shares. Now, some will excuse LeBron's recent falloff on the defensive end as a byproduct of his resting on defense so that he can have more energy on offense. And we can debate the merits of that strategy, but resting on defense is not something Michael Jordan was ever accused of doing. Heck, even as a 40-year-old, he was busting his tail on the defensive end. But what about the notion that LeBron's been the more versatile defender? LeBron supporters will argue that he can guard positions 1 through 5 on the court, such as when he guarded Derrick Rose for stretches in the 2011 playoffs. But LeBron's guarding the opposing team's point guard or center isn't something that happens very often. In fact, during his career, LeBron has spent less than 5% of his total minutes guarding the opposing players 1 or 5. So the versatility argument is highly exaggerated. And look, when it comes to versatility, Hometown Buffet may have a more versatile menu than Spago. That doesn't make it a better restaurant. LeBron's third weakness is that he's not a very good shooter. And this is a pretty significant flaw for someone claiming to be the GOAT. I mean, shooting the ball is the quintessential skill in the game of basketball. It's the part of the game that everyone practices, whether on the playground, at the YMCA, or in the NBA. Now, some people will contend that LeBron is actually a better shooter than Jordan because he has a better career field goal percentage. And yes, LeBron's career field goal percentage is 50.4% compared to Jordan's 49.7%. But recall what I said about placing stats into proper context. To help us understand context when it comes to shooting, allow me to introduce DeAndre Jordan and Tyson Chandler. We all know that DeAndre and Tyson were great rebounders and defenders. But what if I told you that they were also two of the greatest shooters of all time? That would be certifiably crazy. Yet if you look at all the shooting metrics, field goal percentage, effective field goal percentage, true shooting percentage, both of these guys rank near the top in NBA history. Of course, there's an obvious reason for that. As we all know, both DeAndre Jordan and Tyson Chandler take a lot of their shot attempts on dunks, layups, and putbacks, which are extremely high percentage shots. Well, guess what? So does LeBron James. In fact, every single year of his career, the shot that LeBron James has taken the most has been within 0-3 to three feet from the basket. In other words, dunks, layups, and putbacks. More than one of every three of LeBron's shots has been within this point-blank range, which is aided by his playing in an era where it's been relatively easy to get to the rim, particularly when compared to the physical era in which Jordan played. And just like every other player, LeBron is really effective from 0-3 to three feet, hitting over 73% of these shots. But how does LeBron fare from outside this range? According to BasketballReference.com, LeBron's shooting percentage from outside 3 feet is 37.5%. It's even poorer in the playoffs where he shoots 35.9%. And it gets even worse in close and late situations. In the last two minutes of games where the score is within 5 points, LeBron hits only 31.7% of his jumpers. Look, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that these numbers aren't very good, which is probably why in the 2013 Finals, the Spurs' defensive strategy against the Heat was to basically dare LeBron James to shoot. And keep in mind, this was against LeBron in his prime. Can you imagine an opposing coach using a similar strategy against MJ? Now, LeBron actually credits the Spurs for forcing him to work on his jump shot. But it's not as if his results have gotten much better since then. Here's LeBron's shooting percentage from outside 3 feet over the last 6 years. Yikes. Well, I'll give him this, he is consistent. For comparison, consider that in the last year of Michael Jordan's career, as an aging player on the Washington Wizards, Jordan shot close to 42% from outside 3 feet. While that's certainly not great, it means that even as a 40-year-old shell of his former self, Jordan was still a better shooter, a far better shooter, than LeBron James. Unfortunately, Basketball Reference doesn't have advanced shooting metrics from Michael's Bulls days, when he was a significantly more efficient scorer, but few would argue that Michael was anything but a lethal jump shooter when he was wearing red and black. 
When it comes to shooting, all of us can recall practicing shots on the blacktop, counting down three, two, one, before launching a shot at the rim. Well, if you were pretending to be LeBron James, you'd brick almost two thirds of the time. Actually, that's not entirely true. If you were playing against a countdown, it would be much, much worse. And that gets me to the last major weakness of LeBron's game, his performance, or more accurately, lack of performance, in the clutch. Remember when people were praising LeBron for making a couple of buzzer beaters in the playoffs two years ago? They used these stats to claim that LeBron was better in the clutch than Jordan. But look at these numbers carefully. What stands out to you? How about this? People were using a sample size of less than one shot per season to make the case that LeBron was more clutch than Jordan. That would be the equivalent of polling just 100 people in the country to try to predict the winner of the next presidential election. So let's use more telling stats, shall we? Here's a situation that's often used to determine a player's clutchness. Five seconds to go in the fourth quarter or overtime and your team needs a bucket to either win or tie the game. It answers the age-old question, who do you want taking the last shot with the game on the line? It turns out that in the regular season and playoffs combined, LeBron has taken 94 such shots. That's a pretty good sample size. And how many of those 94 shots has LeBron made? 19. For a shooting percentage of 20%. Let me repeat that. 20%. Guys, that's not bad in the clutch. That's atrocious. Michael Jordan in the same situation shot roughly 50%. Yes, that's right. Jordan's performance under pressure was the same as it was throughout the rest of the game. And that, my friends, is the definition of clutch. So there you go. When it comes to the eye test, our eyes tell us that one player, Michael Jordan, is great at everything and has practically no weaknesses. And the other player, LeBron James, while also having a ton of strengths, has several obvious flaws to his game. And when all is said and done, after analyzing the five key factors of being the GOAT, Jordan gets four check marks to LeBron's one. Making this GOAT debate, well, not much of a debate at all. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that LeBron James is a bad player. He's a phenomenal player. Personally, I have him on basketball's Mount Rushmore along with Jordan, Kareem, Will Chamberlain, and Bill Russell. He's just not Michael Jordan. And just to underscore how good MJ was, let's ignore LeBron and Jordan for a minute and focus on the other three players highlighted here, Kareem, Wilt, and Bill Russell. Most would agree that these are the three greatest centers in NBA history, and each of them has a strong case to justify his standing among basketball royalty. Wilt is an all-time great because he was an offensive force of nature, and he holds a ton of NBA records. Russell is in the conversation because he was a dominant defender and a perennial champion. Kareem also led his team to numerous titles, and in terms of individual awards and accolades, was the most decorated of the three. Not to mention, he had the NBA's most unguardable shot. Now imagine a center that had all the best qualities from these three titans. A player like that would be the basketball equivalent of Thanos. Now add to that player the highest level of intangible attributes, such as a tireless work ethic, unmatched killer instinct, and an ability to deliver in the clutch. And now you'd essentially be looking at Thanos with all of the Infinity Stones. And no one would question whether this player was the greatest of all time. But the truth is, we don't have to imagine such a player. That player already existed. He just happened to be a shooting guard, not a center. When you think about it, Michael Jordan is the real life version of an overpowered video game character. He had all the qualities we look for in a superstar athlete, and he had it in spades. He's basically Babe Ruth, if Babe Ruth played defense like Willie Mays. And that's why, even in comparison to the other all-time greats, he is truly in a class of his own. Simply put, he's the GOAT.
Thanks for watching. This was my first video, but if you want me to make more content like this, please subscribe to my channel. Also, if you like what you saw, please click the like button below and share this video with your friends. And leave a comment to give your thoughts on the GOAT debate.